Genshin Impact's got a lot of lore, and you can discover most of it just by playing through the game's main storyline. However, there are plenty of legends, fairy tales, and even some possible foreshadowing hidden away in the various books strewn throughout the world of Tavat. And, because I have the intelligence of Arataki Ito four drinks deep, I decided to read every single one. Now, I'm not an expert on Genshin lore by any means, so if you're looking for an in-depth explanation into exactly how the Great Serpent Orobashi defeated the Dragonairs, from the depths of Enkanomiya and shed its coral scales to create housing for the first inhabitants of Watatsumi Island. Yeah, uh, I can't really help you. Might I suggest a therapist? But if you're curious about the books of Genshin Impact or are thinking about reading a couple but aren't sure where to start, this video is for you. And you're welcome, by the way. It took me like two weeks to read everything. That's time I'll never get back. No human being should know as much as I do about the hydrology of Byakuya Koku. Why did I do this? I've sorted the books into three categories, lore, fiction, and flavour. Lore books describe the story of Genshin Impact and are vital to understanding its history and characters. Fiction books are things like legends, fairy tales, and otherwise made up or unverifiable stories from Tavat. Lastly, flavour is kind of the catch-all category, but think of it as world-building that doesn't impact Genshin's narrative. Poetry and descriptions of landscapes are two good examples of flavor text. Of course, there's tons of overlap between these categories, and it's pretty hard to organize the books at all. Often, fiction is based on real events from Tavat's history, lore books usually have some fabricated elements and unnecessary descriptions in them, but I've sorted them out the best I could so that you, the viewer, can pick which category you like best and explore the books therein. So here's what the lists look like with every Every book sorted into its respective category. There are 92 in total, so don't do what I did and try to read them all. Please don't do it, it's not worth it. Go outside or call your mom or something. Choose life. Next what I've done is categorized all the books into tiers of readability. The tiers I came up with are must read, great, pretty good, meh boring, and non-applicable. They're all relatively straightforward, except for non-applicable, which means the books aren't meant to be entertaining or interesting, they're quite literally just quest items. Most of them say, like, when the autumn sun sets, take 40 steps north and gaze upon the clock tower. It's a clue to solving a puzzle, I'm not gonna include it in my readability tier list. And here's the finished result. Naturally, this is just personal opinion, but you kinda have to listen to me, because who else is stupid enough to read every single book in this lore hellscape that is Genshin Impact? Hopefully no one. As much as I'd love to synopsize every single book, I don't think anybody would watch that. And I really need more watch hours. So I thought I'd briefly cover the must-reads, considering they're the books I'd recommend to everyone. That way, whenever a plot catches your attention, you can go read that book for yourself. And don't worry, I will do my best to avoid spoilers. I'm going off script now, so bear with me. I've never done this in a video before, and we will see what happens. Okay, our first must-read is Yaksha's The Guardian Adepti. This is a story that takes place during the Archon Wars, and it centers around Rex Lapis and some of his Adepti that he summons to help him fight these demons that are manifestations of the other gods' hatred. These Adepti who were gathered are now called the Yakshas, and they fight alongside Rex Lapis to eradicate these demons. For me, it cleared up a lot of questions I had about Zhao's backstory and presents it in a way that's compelling and very easy to digest. It also gives some insight into exactly what Morax aka Rex Lapis was doing during the Archon Wars, cause you kind of just assume that all the gods turned evil and are killing each other. But at least in this instance, Rex Lapis and his Yakshas are like defeating these demons to protect people. So that's cool. Time Trekker is a science fiction novel popular in Fontaine. It follows a man named Siric who invents a time machine and invites his whole town to experience it. He gathers them all together and tells them his tale of time traveling, where he goes back in time to Remuria, the civilization before Fontaine, and he keeps finding these stone tablets with riddles on them, and then when he solves the riddle, it gives him a new time period to go to, so then he goes there, finds a new stone tablet, solves that riddle, and then it keeps going, it keeps going, until he finds the final tablet, which just says zero, and he goes back in time to zero, and some mind-wrenching shenaniganery goes on. 
on. All I will say is the ending is fascinating, and if you're into sci-fi, I would absolutely recommend Time Trekker. The Two Musketeers is a story about a brother and sister looking to get revenge on their wicked father. So they find this old marksman to teach them how to shoot, then they go and confront their father, then there's this whole scene at the end where their brother goes and visits a pub, and it's very tense, but the writing is fantastic. The characters themselves aren't too fleshed out, but the story is captivating, and that last scene gives me chills just thinking about it. Oh, this next one, The Fox and the Dandelion Sea, is one of my favorites. It's a story about a hunter. He finds a fox whose tail is frozen in a lake. In an attempt to shoot it, he accidentally frees the fox and lets it get away. Later that night, the fox visits the hunter's cabin, taking the form of a woman he used to be in love with, and the two strike this deal. The hunter is to teach her fox pup to speak the human tongue. In return, she will teach him fox magic, granting him the ability to shapeshift. Also, as an aside, at one point the fox pup mentions a young boy raised by wolves. I'm almost positive this is Razor, and in my mind at least, he's canonically in this book. Anyway, the hunter is very excited about this deal because he plans to use the shapeshifting to turn into a bird which would help him hunt. He accepts the deal and starts teaching the fox pup to speak the common tongue, and in doing so he grows very close to the pup and its mother, and he kinda doesn't want to leave. And then at the very end, something incredibly tragic happens, and I'm not gonna spoil it, but if you've read the book you know what I'm talking about, and man I wish that wasn't in the book, but you know. Not every story has a happy ending. The Boar Princess. So this one's told by a father to his daughter. I like to imagine he's tucking her into bed and tells her a new volume every night because it starts out as a classic children's story and then it gets really morbid at the end. The last line of the book is a note from the author's wife saying, honey, I think it would be best if we donated this one to the library. <laughs> Like, the author went nuts while writing this, and it's just not a kid's book anymore. So the boar princess is about a princess who is a boar. Boar as in the animal, not boar as in what my videos are. So the boar princess hears about this baby wolf who's freezing in the tundra. She gathers two of her friends, a clever fox and a wise turtle, and the three of them set off into the tundra. And when they find the baby wolf, you know what? I'm gonna spoil this one. They eat the fox and the turtle. The wolf is like, oh, if you really want to prove your friendship to me, you'll eat these two other guys. And the boar princess is like, okay, so she cannibalizes her two best friends and then she goes home with the wolf and then the book ends. What? I'm traumatized. String of Pearls. This one is a play written by Yoon Jin, and when you read it, it actually reads like a script. They've got all of the characters and some stage directions. I love the format of this one. Also, I'm super white, so I'm sorry about the pronunciation of these names. <laughs> Zishin is a young girl working as a fisherman fisherwoman, and she loses her pearl necklace or bracelet. It's not really that important. Then this guy named F Fun Funji <laughs> Fanji. Fangjia. Th I'm gonna go with Fanji. So Fanji is this young man working at the docks. He finds Zishin's pearls and returns them to her, and that's how they meet, and then a romance buds between the two. And then at the end, this villain playboy shows up and kidnaps Zishin. Fanji goes to rescue her, and again, I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but if you're a fan of theater, definitely read this one. Somebody needs to adapt this into a stage play, because if it's a real thing, I'm 1000% gonna go watch. And if there's a casting director out there looking for some Somebody to play Fun G. I've got a couple high school productions under my belt. I've been a Disney prince before. Just leave my headshot here. Okay, cool. Thanks. Robin vs. Chesterson, Iridescent Brooch. This one's a classic detective story. It's about a phantom thief called Robin. Yes, Robin, as in Robin. I know, this is some Phoenix Wright nonsense. Our narrator is Detective Poiret, who goes to this mansion, and a brooch gets stolen. He comes back to talk with his uncle, and of course, because it's a mystery book, there's a big plot twist at the end, but I'd recommend reading this one twice, because once you know the twist, it gets way more tense the second read through. It's actually quite masterfully done. Rex Incognito. Alright, I'm gonna be a bit biased because I love Zhongli, but who doesn't love Zhongli, right? Let's just all be biased together. Rex Incognito is a Liu a fantasy novel telling stories of Rex Lapis throughout the years. My favorite thing about this book is that it's just Rex Lapis going around throwing shade at everyone. He goes and visits Mingwei, a shopkeeper, and tells her that her jade plaque is fake because it's too unblemished. And the two go back and forth telling stories about the Geo Archon, but of course Rex Lapis is the Geo Archon, so he's just toying with her the whole time. My favorite story from this book is in volume 3, where Rex Lapis takes the form of a commoner. He goes to work on a ship, but his boss is very tyrannical and unfair. 
So at one point when he gets himself in trouble, he starts telling his boss a story, and the boss gets so enamored with his story that he doesn't realize everyone's pickpocketing him. So then Rex Lapis takes all of the money that he got, spreads it out to all of the sailors, and then leaves. Man, I love this guy. Records of Julian. It's very similar to Rex Incognito, but rather than just stories about Rex Lapis, it's all stories from that area. It talks a bit about these stone statues that wake up and walk around at night. Apparently they used to fight alongside Rex Lapis in the Archon Wars, and they didn't want to die, so they asked Rex Lapis to turn them to stone. So now they're these immortal warriors walking around in an unfamiliar world, which is the coolest image I can think of. Then there's one about the sea god who marries a mortal woman, and that one's kind of just basic Greek mythology. But reading this book is absolutely worth it for volume one. I loved it. Okay, I have a couple books in here that are kind of just for laughs. Pretty please, Kitsune Guji makes caricatures out of all the characters we know. It's about A and Yaimiko, and it kind of makes Raiden seem like a child. Like, she's always reading light novels and chasing people's attention. She gets one cold and is instantly bedridden, even though she's a literal god. But my favorite part about this book is that it ships A and Yaimiko, like, really hard. If you read through it thinking that in mind that it's meant to be like a fan fiction between the two, it gets pretty steamy. When I read this one through for the second time, I was like, holy crap! This game is made for kids. The whole thing is a parody on fan fiction, which I think is very apt considering the mountains of fan fiction that's already been written about Genshin Impact. It's so funny to me that Hoyoverse released a book that's just fan fiction between two of the most commonly shipped characters. Moonlit Bamboo Forest is about a young boy trying to leave Chingsa Village, but he gets lost in the bamboo forest outside of town. He knows all the local legends about this area, and it's bad news to be trapped there. He wanders around for a bit, then he finds this young woman in the forest who leads him out. He worries for a bit that she's gonna lead him into a trap, but he gets out safely and then moves to Liwa Harbor for a very successful career. Then we cut to the end of the story when the boy is now an old man who's retired back to Chingsa village. He finds this golden hair on his shoulder and it ends. There are lots of theories about what this means and who this young woman was in the forest. Some people say it's Rex Lapis, some people say it's Ganyu's mother, I don't really know, but I'm putting it in must read because the writing is really good. It's one of those books where the descriptions are so detailed you feel like you're right there with the the main character. Shogun Almighty, reborn as Raiden with unlimited power. This is another one of those books that doesn't take itself too seriously. It's about some dude who gets reincarnated as the Raiden Shogun, then he gets into a big fight with a bunch of samurai, but he doesn't know how to use any of Raiden's abilities. And that's it. That's the whole book. It's a parody of the isekai genre. Any of you who are familiar with isekai would probably recognize that just from reading the title. It's a very amusing read. And remember, most of these books are published by the Yai Publishing House, which is run by Yai Miko, who is Raiden's second in command and close personal friend. So she's approving all these books that make fun of Raiden Shogun. That's so funny to me. Let's go, Dodoko. This one's really cute. It was written by Klee and Yoimiya. It's just talking about Klee and her doll. They go to Inazuma, visit the sacred Sakura, eat some onigiri, and watch Yoimiya's fireworks. At the end, it says we're also Dodoko's friends, which is adorable and made me feel warm and fuzzy inside. Gliding instruction manual is definitely my least conventional pick. It starts with a few rules on using gliders, don't drink and glide being my favorite, and the next section is dedicated to showing examples of what might happen if you don't follow the rules. At least, that's what the author claims, because I'm pretty sure this whole section is to make fun of people who decide to do stupid stuff with gliders. My favorite is the story of Rudolph, who claims climbs up his roof and tries to glide off to impress his daughter, but he just falls and breaks his ass. <laughs> Poor guy's catching strays in the gliding instruction manual. They did not have to put that in. <laughs> That's so funny. Heart's Desire is a collection of stories about this supernatural antique shop. It's pretty abstract and I don't totally understand what it means, but the characters are interesting and the shop itself is very intriguing. They also include instructions on how to find the shop, so of course I had to try them out. To reach that place, one must stand before the fountain and close their eyes, then wait for 35 heartbeats, then walk seven circles clockwise around the fountain, followed by seven further circles anti-clockwise. Upon opening one's eyes, one will find they have arrived at a little shop. Kinda sounds like this is written by an adepti. I don't know if that means anything, but there's a nugget for all you Genshin theorists out there. A preliminary study of Sangonomiya folk belief. I know, it sounds so interesting, right? Don't let the title fool you though, this book is very interesting. It details the great serpent Orobashi emerging from the deep at the end of the Archon War, and bringing people with it to live in the land of coral, later known as Watatsumi Island. The reason I have this one in must read and not Byakuya Koku is that this one tells generally the same story, but it's shorter and easier to read. It's also told as a narrative, so I think it's easier to digest than Byakuya Koku, which is written as a historical record. 
Oh, hey, I think I did a pretty good job. The unscripted part of the video is over. Script. Script. I need my script. I really enjoyed reading a good chunk of these books. Many of them are incredibly clever and well-written. Some of them make me want to prostrate myself in front of a miniature -al, but at least my suffering can help all you lovely people decide which books to read. Prostrating myself so you don't have to. Hopefully hearing about all these books has made a positive impact on your life. A Genshin. Imp okay, I'll go away now. As payment for my hard work, I ask not for your mora. Simply that you consider pressing subscribe, clicking like, or watching some of my other garbage.